Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Elizabeth Schoaf, a teenage girl from from South Carolina in the US who just suddenly disappeared during her walk home from school one day in the fall of 2006. When Elizabeth disappeared, a huge search ensued to try and find her. Elizabeth's family and the police and even volunteers were doing everything that they could to figure out what had happened to Elizabeth and bring her home. And eventually there was a breakthrough. There was a huge lead in the case when it seemed as though Elizabeth herself had made contact with her mum through a text message and following this as the case started to unfold the sinister truth about what happened to Elizabeth eventually came to light. But just quickly before we get into the case I would like to say a huge thank you to HelloFresh for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now you guys know by this point that I absolutely adore HelloFresh. I've spoken about them numerous times on my channel before they are a meal kit delivery service that makes cooking at home so much easier. HelloFresh offers a huge variety of delicious recipes every single week which can be delivered straight to your door. All you have to do is go to their website, have a look through their meal options, pick which meals you would like that week and they will send you the instructions on how to make the meals and a box full of all of the pre-portioned ingredients that you will need. I've always said that one of the things that I love most about HelloFresh is how damn convenient it is. Sometimes after I've had a long day of doing work, the last thing that I want to be doing in the evening is rooting around the cupboards trying to figure out what I can make myself for dinner with the ingredients that we have in the house. Because to be honest, most of the time we don't have every single ingredient that I need to make the meal I decide upon. So then I either have to try and work out what else to make or run to the shop to buy the other ingredients. And I don't want to spend my evenings doing that. When I finish working, I just want to make a quick tasty meal and sit down and enjoy it and relax. Which is why HelloFresh is just perfect for me. It saves me so much time and stress and money and it also saves me from wasting any food because when you pick your HelloFresh meals you can select how many people you will be cooking for and they will give you the right amount of ingredients based on that. And HelloFresh's plans are completely flexible. So say for example you usually get four HelloFresh deliveries every single week but one week you don't require all four. Maybe you're eating out a bit more that week or something. Well with HelloFresh you can change how many recipes you want each week so that again you can save money and also no food goes to waste. I've been using HelloFresh for probably years now and I just could not recommend them more. So if you would like to check them out then head to the link in my description box. And for those of you who also live in the UK I have a really incredible offer to share with you. If you use the discount code MOLLYW60 you can receive 60% off of your first box and then 25% off of your next eight boxes. You can also scan the QR code that is on screen right now to receive that offer too. Thank you so much again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the abduction of a teenage girl and it involves heavy themes such as the rape and sexual assault of a child and mental health issues such as depression, anxiety and PTSD. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back to early September of 2006 in the small town of Lugoff which is located in Kershaw County in the state of South Carolina and this is Elizabeth Schoaf. She was a 14 year old girl who lived in Lugoff with her family. Elizabeth was born on the 3rd of October 1991 to parents Don and Madeline Schoaf and she was one of three children, the middle child of three children. She had an older sister named Susie who was about five years older than her and a younger brother named Donnie who was two years younger. Although by the time this case took place Elizabeth's older sister Susie had moved out so it was just Elizabeth, her brother and her parents living in the family home. But despite this Elizabeth was still incredibly close with her big sister. Susie said in a 
documentary that I watched that Elizabeth was honestly the best sister anyone could ask for. Susie would try to come home and see her family every single weekend and she and Elizabeth would enjoy spending time together. They would just chat and watch TV. They just had a very strong sisterly bond. But Elizabeth enjoyed spending time with everyone in her family. She was very family oriented. Her loved ones meant everything to her and her family described her as being very sweet and kind and loving. The kind of girl that was always there for other people and who always wanted everyone to be happy. At 14 years old Elizabeth was into all the things that pretty much every teenage girl was into. She enjoyed makeup and listening to music and playing video games. She had a boyfriend, his name was Nath and I think he was her first proper boyfriend so it was a very exciting time for her. They were school sweetheart. Anne Elizabeth was looking forward to starting high school. I think in the fall of 2006 she was just going into the ninth grade and she was looking forward to it. It was a new chapter in her life that she was excited to begin. However in early September of 2006 life for Elizabeth and the entire show family was turned completely upside down when a sudden and tragic event took place which would change their lives forever and it all started when Elizabeth didn't return home from school one afternoon. The date was the 6th of September 2006. It was a Wednesday and the day began just like any other for the show family. Elizabeth woke up, she got ready for school and then at around a quarter past seven that morning her mother Madeline drove her to the bus stop because Elizabeth would get the bus to school every day. Elizabeth and her mum had a little bit of a bicker when they got to the bus stop because Elizabeth realised that she had forgotten her mascara and so she asked her mum if they could drive back to the house to get it but Madeline said no. She was probably worried that Elizabeth would miss the bus if they did. So Elizabeth being a teenage girl was a little bit stroppy and frustrated with her mum and she got out of the car feeling annoyed and then she got on the bus and she headed to school. As far as I'm aware school went fine. It was just like any other school day and then when school came to an end Elizabeth got back on the bus to go home. She got off the bus at approximately 3.30 that afternoon and usually Elizabeth would have to walk home from the bus stop because as I understand it by this time of day her parents Don and Madeline would usually still be at work so there was no one to pick her up. The distance between the bus stop and her home was about 200 yards and Elizabeth would have to walk up a little hill to get there. Although she usually wasn't walking alone there were a couple of friends who got off at the same stop as her and they would normally walk back towards her house with Elizabeth before going to their own houses. But on this particular day that did not happen because these friends had a lift. One of the friend's brothers came to pick them up and the friends asked Elizabeth if she wanted a lift too. They could drop her home if she wanted. However Elizabeth politely declined and said that she would just carry on walking. And so the friends drove away and that's exactly what Elizabeth started doing. She continued walking the short distance to her house. However Elizabeth never made it back to her house. She never returned home. After saying goodbye to those friends and walking away she just completely disappeared. And it wasn't long before alarm bells started to ring for the show family. When Elizabeth didn't come home her younger brother Donnie informed their aunt Lisa on the phone. Lisa was their mother Madeline's sister. And when Lisa rang her sister Madeline while she was still at work and she told her that Elizabeth wasn't back from school yet, immediately Madeline left work and she went straight home because she was worried. It appears as though the family waited for a little while just hoping that she would soon walk through the door, hoping that there would be a reasonable explanation for why she was late. They were waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing. There was no sign of Elizabeth. And so at around 5.30pm, about two hours after Elizabeth would have gotten off the bus, the family picked up the phone and they called the police to report her as missing. Police officers were sent to the show's home soon after and initially when the police started looking into the case, they actually believed pretty much straight away that Elizabeth was a runaway. They believed that she had decided not to come home that afternoon and that at some point she'd return. I'm guessing that her mother Madeline would have told them about the little disagreement that she and her daughter had had earlier that day about not letting Elizabeth go home and fetch her mascara before getting on the school bus and how Elizabeth walked away feeling quite annoyed and so 
so uh, perhaps that's partly the reason why the police believe she was a runaway. She was still upset with her mum and so when she got off the bus that afternoon she decided to stay out. She wasn't going to go home just yet. However her family knew that that was not the case. There was no way that Elizabeth would do that. She was just not the type to run away from home because she would have hated the thought of her family worrying about her. She wouldn't have wanted to put them through that and so the police began the search for Elizabeth. That same evening officers started looking in the area around her house to try and find her but unfortunately they couldn't. 14 year old Elizabeth Schoff was nowhere to be seen. The search for Elizabeth continued the next morning. More police officers were brought in to join the search and they carried on searching the area around Elizabeth's home. The issue was though this was a big area. The Show family lived in a very rural area out in the countryside. There wasn't that many other houses around I don't think and they were completely surrounded by woods, this big woodland. So the police had a lot of ground to cover, a lot of land to search and as well as doing that other officers were speaking to and taking statements from all of the people in Elizabeth's life, her family and friends just to get a better picture of the kind of girl that she was and whether or not there was anyone in her life that could have had a motive for wanting her to disappear. If she had been abducted or if foul play had been involved in her disappearance then was the person responsible someone that she knew personally? The detectives looked into Elizabeth's boyfriend Nath. Obviously as with any murder or missing persons case one of the first people they look at is always the partner of the victim. So they asked him where he was at the time that Elizabeth vanished and and he said that he was at home and when they checked this alibi it was confirmed to be true so that was Nath ruled out as a suspect. In addition to the boyfriend the police also looked into the friends that Elizabeth got off the school bus with, the friends who offered her a lift home that day however eventually they too were ruled out as having anything to do with her disappearance. Meanwhile as all of these individuals were being looked into still police were out looking for Elizabeth and it wasn't just police officers actually. A load of Elizabeth's family and friends and even volunteers were out searching. They were walking around just looking for any trace of her and shouting Elizabeth's name. The police had search dogs brought in, there were helicopters searching the area from above just trying to see if they could spot anything and the police also appealed to the public and the media and Elizabeth's face was quickly all over the news. Detectives were urging anyone with any information regarding Elizabeth's whereabouts to come forward. Missing posters and flyers with Elizabeth's face on were created and distributed around the area. The police and Elizabeth's loved ones were just doing everything that they could to get Elizabeth's story out there as much as possible because obviously the more people see her face and are made aware that she is missing then the higher chance they have of someone spotting her. And as a result of this and as a result of the media coverage many tips and leads did come in. Over the coming days the police received hundreds and hundreds of calls to their tip line of potential leads in various potential sightings of Elizabeth. They even received one potential sighting of her all the way in Texas. Someone thought that they saw a young girl matching Elizabeth's description in a truck in Texas. However unfortunately when the police looked into this and other sightings it was confirmed that they actually were not Elizabeth. It was literally just dead end after dead end. But I mean no one was giving up. The police and the family were still so determined to find Elizabeth and bring her home. And her family kept that hope that she would be found alive. They couldn't allow themselves to even consider the other possibility that she would be found dead. They were just like no we are going to find her and she is going to be okay. It was a big struggle for the police though because they really had nothing to go on at all. They had absolutely no trace of Elizabeth, no idea where she had gone. And as I said, all of the tips that they were getting were just leading them nowhere. Elizabeth didn't have her own cell phone, so obviously they wouldn't be able to trace her through phone data. So they were finding it so difficult to piece this case together, piece together where Elizabeth might have gone. But then on day seven, exactly one week into the search, there was an absolutely huge development in the case when suddenly Elizabeth's mother Madeline received a 
text message from an unknown number. A text message that claimed to have been sent by her missing daughter. The text came through on the 13th of September 2006, the same day that a vigil for Elizabeth was being held, and it read, quote, Hey mum, it's Lizzie. I'm in a hole in the ground near Charm Hill. It's near that dirt road where those big trucks go. Get the police though because he has bombs hidden. And as soon as Elizabeth's mum received this text message, she was completely convinced that it truly was her daughter that sent it. She didn't think that it was someone pretending to be Elizabeth. She wholeheartedly believed that it was her. And the rest of the family agreed. When they saw this text message, they too thought that Elizabeth had written it, mainly because of the way that she spelt her name in the message. She spelt it L-I-Z-Y with one Z rather than two, which is how she'd always spelt her name. And also Lizzie was what her family called her. They rarely called her Elizabeth. It was always Lizzie. So Madeline immediately showed this text message to the detectives and now they had their first big lead in the case. They could use this text to hopefully find Elizabeth and find her alive. Of course, there was always the possibility that this text was a hoax. It was someone trying to pull a sick prank on the family. But if that wasn't the case, if it really was Elizabeth, then the police needed to find her as quickly as possible before it was too late before whoever abducted her decided to do something even more sinister. Now as we know Elizabeth said in the message that she believed she was in or near Charm Hill which according to sources was this land owned by a mining company it was private property and as I understand it it was still within the woodland near Elizabeth's house and it was an area that the police had not yet searched themselves but of course as soon as they received this text message the searches immediately began in and around this specific area. They were searching all night that evening and the next day, but still nothing. No sign of Elizabeth or this hole in the ground that she described in the text. However, as the searches in Charm Hill were happening, US Marshals also started looking more into the phone number that this text message had come from. Because as I said earlier, Elizabeth didn't have a cell phone. So if it was her that sent this message, perhaps she sent it from her abductor's phone. The US Marshals were able to look at the data from the phone and it was during this process when they actually identified who the phone was registered under, who the owner of the phone that sent the text message was. The owner was a man named Vincent Fillior. Vincent was 36 years old. He'd previously worked as a construction worker, although I think he was unemployed by the time this case took place, and he was a local. He also lived in Lugar. And when the detectives took a deeper look into him, they discovered something very alarming he was actually a wanted man. There had been a warrant for his arrest for about a year by the time this case occurred and the reason for this warrant was because he had been accused of sexually assaulting a 12 year old girl and as soon as the police found this out they immediately thought this is the kind of individual that we are looking for. This is a man who has been accused of sexually abusing a child, a 12 year old and now the police have traced his phone as being the phone that missing 14 year old Elizabeth Schoff sent a text message from. A text message which suggested that she had been kidnapped and was being held hostage. So it was looking like Vincent Fillior, this alleged sexual predator, may have been the kidnapper. So the police quickly went to Vincent Fillior's address to speak with him. He lived in a trailer home. However, when they arrived, he was not there. There was no sign of him. Although his girlfriend was there. Now, from what I can gather, his girlfriend was actually the mother of the 12-year-old girl that Vincent had been accused of having sexually assaulted. But despite that, she was still with him. She was still in a relationship with Vincent. And when the police got to his address and they spoke with Vincent's girlfriend, she seemed to be pretty protective of Vincent. It seemed as though initially she wasn't really willing to cooperate with the police, but eventually she allowed them to have a look around their home, the trailer, and when they did, 
the detectives came to a realisation. They realised why Vincent Fillior had been able to escape capture for a whole year. Why previous officers were never able to find and apprehend him. It was because he had his own secret hiding place in his trailer home, or underneath his trailer home, I should say. When the police investigating Elizabeth's disappearance looked around his home, they discovered that there was literally a hole in the floor in one of the rooms. He had cut this hole in the floor so that when the police came knocking, he could jump into it, quickly cover it over with an object or some furniture, and then just hide in there. Hide underneath the trailer until they left. And unbelievably, it worked. They never found him. They never discovered this secret hiding place until now, of course. Although when the police looked into this hole, he wasn't in there. It's not where he was hiding this time. The police carried on searching around the trailer, both on the inside and around the outside, and something else they discovered just behind the trailer was a couple of underground bunkers that Vincent Fillior had dug, some of which he had filled in, some of which he hadn't. They had a look in these bunkers, and again, there was no sign of Vincent, and also no sign of Elizabeth, but these bunkers, again, made alarm bells ring, again made the police believe even more more that Vincent Fillior was involved in Elizabeth Show's disappearance. Because remember, Elizabeth said in that text message to her mum that she believed she was in a hole in the ground. Was that hole that she was referring to an underground bunker? A bunker just like these ones that Vincent had dug behind his home? It was at this point when the police were very confident that Vincent Fillior was the number one suspect in the case. And not long after this, the sheriff in charge of the case made the very controversial decision to release this information about Vincent Fillior and about the text message to the media and the public. In a bid to try and find Vincent, the sheriff decided to inform the public that he was the top suspect in Elizabeth's disappearance and they also decided to tell the public that Elizabeth's mother had received a text message which claimed to have been sent from her missing daughter. Now they obviously did this in the hope that someone would spot Vincent somewhere and come forward to the police with his location. However, as I just said, this decision came with a lot of controversy. Specifically, the fact that the information about the text message was released. A lot of people, including Elizabeth's family, I think, were not happy that the police had told the media about the text message because, understandably, they were scared about what Elizabeth's abductor, about what Vincent might do to Elizabeth, if he found this out, if he saw on the news that Elizabeth had used his phone to secretly message her mum, then God knows what he would do to her. He could just lose it and kill her out of anger. This just seemed like an incredibly risky decision for the police to make. A decision that could put Elizabeth's life in danger even more. And a decision that they didn't even let Elizabeth's family know was happening beforehand. They didn't tell the family that they were going to tell the media about the text message. The family had to see it on the news and of course they were stunned but alas the decision had been made. The information was out there now so all the police could hope for was that it did not backfire. In the meantime the searches in the woods continued mainly in and around the Charm Hill area and then on the 16th of September 2006 so by this point Elizabeth had been missing for 10 days and finally the police had found what they had been looking for. They found Elizabeth and miraculously she was actually alive. As officers and searchers were walking through the woods, all of a sudden Detective Dave Tomley, who had been assigned to the case just the morning after Elizabeth went missing, all of a sudden he heard something, a noise. He heard the sound of a young girl and so he told all of the other officers to stop where they were and stay silent, probably to make sure that he wasn't mistaken, that he wasn't imagining this noise, and he wasn't. The others could hear it too. They could hear the voice of a young girl 
shouting, screaming for how. And so they started running in the direction of where the shouting was coming from, whilst also being as wary and careful as they could be, just in case there really were bombs in the area, like the text message had stated. So they were following this noise until eventually they spotted the girl that was yelling for help. And it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shove. And Detective Tomley just went straight up to her and he gave her a big hug to let her know that she was safe now and as he was hugging Elizabeth he looked down at the ground and near where she was standing there was an underground bunker which Detective Tomley described as looking like quote the mouth of hell. It was clear that this dirty and dark hole in the ground was where Elizabeth had been held captive since her disappearance. After 10 long days of searching for 14 year old Elizabeth Schoff had finally been found and by some miracle she was still alive. Although everyone was hoping that this would be the outcome, I can imagine that as time went on, as the days went by, it probably seemed as though the chances of finding her alive were just decreasing and decreasing. Their hope was slowly starting to fade, so the fact that they had found her alive, it was almost unbelievable. As soon as she was rescued, Elizabeth was taken straight to the hospital so that she could be checked out and she was finally reunited with her family. Her parents came into the hospital room and they just wrapped their arms around her and they kept telling her that she was okay now, she was safe. And when Elizabeth felt ready, she talked the police through exactly what had happened to her. And I just want to give a pre-warning before we get into it. It is very upsetting. What Elizabeth went through over the 10 days that she was missing is just absolutely horrific and terrifying. So of course it all began on the afternoon of the 6th of September 2006 after Elizabeth got off the school bus. As we discussed earlier on in the video it was just a typical day at school for Elizabeth and then after she got off the bus she started walking home. She obviously declined that lift from friends and she carried on walking towards her home alone but she never made it there because during her walk, she was confronted by a stranger. A stranger who she would eventually come to learn was 36-year-old Vincent Fillior. Vincent stepped out of the woods in front of Elizabeth and he told her that he was a police officer. He was an officer with the Kershaw County Police Department, which was obviously a lie. But of course, Elizabeth at the time did not know that. In fact, Vincent was even wearing this fake Kershaw County Police t-shirt which he made himself to trick her. He told Elizabeth that he was a police officer and that the police had found marijuana on her family's property and that she needed to come with him because she was under arrest and he said that other police officers had already arrested her brother Donnie and Elizabeth said that this made her start to panic straight away. As soon as he mentioned her little brother she immediately started to worry about him and so she agreed to go with this officer thinking that she would be reunited with Donnie and thinking that the family really were in trouble. Vincent then put some handcuffs on Elizabeth and immediately after he placed some kind of device attached to some rope around her neck and he told Elizabeth that, that it was a bomb and that if she did anything, if she tried to run or scream, he would use this bomb. He would set it off so that it would blow her up, essentially. So, of course, she was absolutely terrified. Vincent then started walking Elizabeth through the woods, and they were walking for a good while while she was still in these handcuffs and had this device around her neck. And Elizabeth had noticed this. She noticed that they had been walking for a while, for at least an hour, and they were almost walking in circles. They were just walking around the woods again and again. It seemed seemed as though Vincent was probably doing this to make her feel confused and disorientated and so eventually Elizabeth asked Vincent what was going on, where was her brother, where were the other police officers and he responded basically saying something along the lines of come on Elizabeth you're a smart girl you should have figured it out by now. He told Elizabeth that he wasn't actually arresting her, he wasn't a police officer, he had actually 
kidnapped her. As they continued walking through the woods, Vincent asked 14-year-old Elizabeth if she was a virgin until eventually they stopped. And it was then when Elizabeth thought to herself, okay, this is it. This is where my life ends. This is where I get raped and killed. But then Vincent actually leaned down to the ground and he pulled up this wooden door, which Elizabeth hadn't spotted before. It was very, very well disguised. It was covered in leaves and greenery, so it blended in with the rest of the woods. It was almost camouflage. Vincent pulled up this wooden door, which was the entrance to this underground bunker that he had dug, this hole in the ground, and he forced Elizabeth to get into it. She walked down this hole via a ladder that Vincent had made out of sticks and branches, and then Vincent climbed in after her. Elizabeth recalls how the bunker was small and dark and dirty. The walls were just soil and dirt because obviously it was underground. According to one source, there was a load of trash just lying around, but at the same time, it was literally like a tiny house almost. There was a bed. Vincent had made this bed again out of like twigs and branches and twine. There was a makeshift toilet which was really just a broken patio chair and a bucket. He apparently had a propane tank for cooking. There was a mini portable battery operated television and there was also what looked like bomb making equipment in the bunker. Vincent had been making his own bombs. After forcing Elizabeth down into the bunker and going in after her, Vincent locked the wooden door with a padlock so that Elizabeth couldn't get out and then immediately he removed Elizabeth's clothing and he raped her. After the rape, he wouldn't allow her to put her clothes back on. She was kept naked in there and then he put this chain around her neck which he secured with a padlock, almost like it was a dog collar. And then the chain was secured to the ceiling so that, again, there was no way she could try and run away. She was trapped. She was completely under his control. And this chain was kept around her neck for days. Vincent wouldn't even take it off Elizabeth at night. She had to sleep with this metal chain around her neck. Elizabeth was raped repeatedly during her captivity. Vincent raped her between two to five times every single day. And obviously, as we know, during the time that she was missing, there was a huge search effort going on to try and find her. The police and volunteers were out in the woods every single day looking for Elizabeth. And Elizabeth could literally hear this. As she was chained up in the bunker with Vincent, the two of them would hear the sounds of the helicopters flying above who were trying to see if they could spot her. They could hear the sound of people walking around, but the searchers never spotted the bunker, despite the fact that it was less than a mile away from Elizabeth's home. But they didn't spot it because it was so well camouflaged. As I said, it was covered with leaves and sticks, so it just blended in with the ground. And whilst they would hear the police and the searchers walking around above the bunker, whilst they would hear their footsteps, Vincent would put his hand over Elizabeth's mouth. And one source states that he would even hold this taser gun to her head as a warning. If she tried to scream, he would use it and he would kill her. At one point in the early days of her captivity, Elizabeth asked Vincent why he was doing this. What had she done? Why had he chosen her? And he basically just said that she was the easiest target. As I said earlier, Vincent lived locally and it turns out that he had actually been watching the young girls in the neighbourhood for a while. He had been watching Elizabeth for a while to the point where he had basically gotten to know her everyday routine. He knew what time she would go to school in the morning. He knew what time she would walk home from the bus stop in the afternoon. And so he decided that she was the perfect victim. She was the girl that he was going to abduct and keep prisoner in his bunker. So this crime was incredibly premeditated. He had been planning this for a long time before he actually kidnapped Elizabeth. In the first few days, Elizabeth said that she just felt hopeless. She had absolutely no idea what to do, how the hell she was going to get out of this bunker alive. However, she did notice 
noticed that Vincent had a couple of weapons in his bunker. Like I mentioned, he had a taser, he had a couple of knives, and he also had a pistol. It turns out that it was actually a pellet pistol, but Elizabeth came up with a plan. One night, when Vincent was sleeping, because he slept in the bunker with her, they would sleep on the same bed in there. Anyway, one night when he was sleeping, Elizabeth was going to get out of bed, grab the pistol, and shoot him. She was going to kill him. So the night time came, she waited for Vincent to fall asleep, fall into a deep sleep, and then she slowly crept out of bed. She grabbed the pistol and she pointed it at Vincent's head and pulled the trigger. But nothing happened. Nothing came out of it because the gun had gotten jammed. Her attempt to kill her abductor and rapist had failed and Elizabeth immediately just started crying her eyes out but she quickly put the gun back where it was and she got back into the bed before Vincent woke up and realised what she was doing. As time went on as the days went by Elizabeth devised a new plan to try and stay alive. She decided that she was going to try her best to just go along with whatever Vincent said or did to her to try and keep him from shouting and losing his temper. If he told her to keep quiet and not say anything, she did exactly that. Anything he told her to do, she did. She also started just trying to make small talk with Vincent, asking him about himself and his life, trying to get him to open up more. She started just chatting to him like you would chat to a friend so that he would kind of slowly let his guard down. She began fighting back less and less when he would rape her because she realised that then he would be less violent and aggressive and therefore it would make the sexual assaults just a tiny bit more bearable for her. She even started to pretend that she enjoyed it so that he would be less aggressive. Honestly, what this 14-year-old girl went through is just sickening. I cannot imagine the sheer terror that she must have experienced, how scared she must have been not knowing how this was going to end. Was she going to make it out of this bunker alive or was Vincent going to murder her here? If he didn't murder her, would she ever make it out of this bunker? Was he going to keep her locked up in here for the rest of her life? I really cannot imagine just how frightened she must have been. But I mean, what an incredibly intelligent girl as well. She was a teenager and she was literally using reverse psychology techniques on this man to try and make it safer for herself. She was using these reverse psychology techniques so that he would let his guard down, as I said, and it did begin to work. As Elizabeth was chatting to him more and more, he started to open up and trust her, so he allowed her to eventually put her clothes back on after each time he raped her. He eventually unlocked the chain from her neck so that it was easier for her to sleep at night. On a few occasions, he allowed Elizabeth to stand outside of the bunker for a few minutes to get some fresh air. Obviously, whilst there were no police or searchers around, and of course, he stood with her so that she didn't run away. At night time they would walk to a nearby pond so that Elizabeth could wash. Elizabeth said that Vincent started calling her baby and he would say that he loved her and she would just say it back because she knew that this was how she was going to keep herself free from harm. She had to pretend that she had fallen in love with him too so that he wouldn't hurt her. She was in complete survival mode doing and saying anything that she could to prevent him from killing her. They would sit and watch TV together in the bunker and tragically Elizabeth would actually see the media pills on the television. She would see her face on the news. She would see that the police and her family were searching for her. Vincent would watch the appeals constantly too because he wanted to know how the investigation was progressing, whether or not the police were close to catching him. Now during her captivity, Elizabeth had noticed that Vincent had a cell phone. At night time while she was washing herself in the pond, she noticed that he would use his phone to send text messages to his girlfriend. And so Elizabeth thought to herself, maybe she could use his phone to secretly send a message to her mother, Madeline, to let her know where she was. And then she would be saved. The police would know where to find her. And so when Vincent would fall asleep at night, she would again crawl out of bed, being as quiet as she possibly could so that he didn't wake up. She got a hold of 
his phone and she would start typing out these texts to her mum. And on one occasion when she did this, Vincent did actually wake up and he asked Elizabeth what she was doing with his phone. And she would quickly exit and delete the text message that she was writing and she would press on the snake game on his phone. And she would say, oh, I'm just playing the snake game. And he believed her and would just go back to sleep. And over the next few nights, she would continue to sneak his phone and try to send texts to her mum but tragically they would never go through. It just kept saying the message failed to send because there was no phone signal in the bunker. Elizabeth would even try to hold the phone out of the ground through a little gap in the wooden door to get them to send but she had no luck. It wouldn't work. Or at least she didn't think it had worked at the time. Unbeknownst to her, one of the messages to her mum did luckily go through the text message that we talked about earlier. The one where Elizabeth said that she was in a hole in the ground and to tell the police to be careful because there were bombs hidden. Obviously, as I mentioned before, Vincent had what appeared to be bomb making equipment in the bunker. And just as a side note, he had also told told Elizabeth that he had hidden bombs on the ground above the bunker. He said that they were hidden all around the bunker so that if the police got too close, he could set them off and kill them. As we know, when Elizabeth's mum received this text message, she shared it with the police who decided to share it with the public and the media. And so on day nine of Elizabeth's captivity, Vincent and Elizabeth were watching the TV appeals as usual. And all of a sudden, on the news, they started talking about the text message that Madeline Schoaf had received, which claimed to be from her missing daughter. And they said on the news that the police were looking for Vincent Fillior in connection to Elizabeth's disappearance, because obviously the police had discovered by this point that the phone the text had been sent from was registered in Vincent's name. And as soon as this came up on the news, Vincent Fillior slowly turned his head and he stared at Elizabeth. And Elizabeth said that in that moment, her heart just dropped. He immediately started shouting at Elizabeth, asking her if it was true, if she had sent these text messages to her mum. And she tried to deny it. She was trying to convince Vincent that it wasn't her. She hadn't sent any text to her mum. She said that she loved Vincent and that she never would have betrayed his trust like that. Again, she was just saying anything she could to keep him from losing it and hurting her. And it was during this when Elizabeth noticed something Vincent was also terrified. He was now so scared that he was going to be caught. He knew that he was now the police's number one suspect in the case and he was scared that it was only a matter of time before they caught him. He was really, really panicking at this point and so he started asking Elizabeth what he should do. How should he get out of this? And Elizabeth told him to run. She said to Vincent, you need to leave. You need to run as far away as possible, somewhere where they cannot find you. And she told Vincent that shortly after she would meet him. She would reunite with him and they could go on the run together. They could be together. And Vincent believed her and he agreed. He started packing a bag. He said goodbye to Elizabeth. He gave her a hug and he said that he loved her. And then he left the bunker and he went on the run. Now, Elizabeth could have also left at that point. She could have left the bunker. However, she didn't feel that it was safe to yet because she was worried that he would return shortly after and catch her trying to leave or that he would be waiting in the woods for her. And so she actually decided to stay in the bunker that night on her own. She slept in the bed and then the following morning, so this was the morning of the 16th of September 2006, 10 days after she was abducted. That morning she woke up, she looked around the bunker, realised that Vincent hadn't come back, he really had gone, and so she decided that now was the time she was going to make her escape. She opened the wooden door, climbed up the ladder, and out of the bunker. And once she was above ground, she immediately started shouting and screaming for help. She didn't want to run away from the bunker, again, because of what Vincent had told her about their being 
bums hidden around it. So she just stayed in that spot and she started screaming for help at the top of her lungs. And as we know, that is when Detective Dave Tomley heard her screams and he ran up to Elizabeth and gave her a hug. And then she was taken to the hospital. Finally, this horrific ordeal was over. Finally, she was safe. But of course, this case was so far from over, the police had finally found Elizabeth, but they still had to find her abductor and rapist Vincent Fillior and thankfully it did not take them long to do so because in the early hours of the following morning around like 2 30 a.m Vincent was spotted about five miles away from his home. He approached this woman who was about to get into her car and he threatened her at knife point. He pulled out a knife and he demanded that she give him her car keys. He was going to steal her car and use it to get as far away as possible possible whilst he was on the run. However, this woman actually recognised Vincent's face from the news and she said, no, she was not going to give him her key. She was not going to help him get away. And so Vincent just ran off and the woman called the police. And just a couple of hours after this, Vincent was found still around that area and he was arrested. Later that day, he was interviewed by the detectives and I don't think he denied it. He admitted his involvement in Elizabeth's disappearance, but he didn't feel at all guilty. He didn't feel bad about what he had done to her. In his eyes, he hadn't done anything wrong. He even went so far as to try and convince people that Elizabeth, 14 year old Elizabeth, was in on the whole thing and that she was compliant. She was happy being with him in the bunker. She consented to being held hostage. But regardless, Vincent was of course charged with a number of different crimes, obviously including kidnapping, possession of explosives, impersonating a police officer, and 10 counts of sexual assault, one count for each day that Elizabeth was held captive in the bunker. And when it came to his court proceedings, he pleaded guilty to all charges. And in September of 2007, a year after the crime, Vincent Filial was sentenced to 421 years in prison. So it was safe to say that he was going to remain behind bars until the day that he died, which he did. Vincent Filial was in prison for about 15 years until he died in May of 2021 at the age of 51. He was found unresponsive in his cell at the McCormick Correctional Institution in South Carolina and his cause of death has actually never been released so we don't know exactly how he died. As you can imagine, Elizabeth suffered hugely with her mental health as a result of what happened to her. She suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder as well as depression and anxiety. She would often get panic attacks and she suffered from nightmares and she developed sleeping disorders. She was a different person. The abuse that she had suffered at the hands of Phil Yor had changed her forever and her aunt Lisa described how the light in her niece's eyes was just gone after her abduction. The innocence was gone. She was just 14 years old when she went through one of the most harrowing and traumatic things I think anyone could ever go through. So it's completely understandable why she suffered with her mental health so much afterwards. But over time, it appears as though Elizabeth did start to feel better and build up her confidence again. She said in a documentary that I watched that what happened to her in 2006 is always going to be there. It's always going to be a part of her. She's never going to be able to forget it. However, over the years it has gotten easier to deal with and she has moved forward with her life. I have a really beautiful quote here from Elizabeth that I really wanted to share with you guys. She said, you have to look at the whole picture itself. There's way more good times than there are bad times. You just got to move on. You can truly make yourself happy if you keep on pushing. The dust may never settle but I feel like I am at peace. Today Elizabeth Schoff is in her early 30s. She is is a mother. She has a little baby boy and she works as a dental assistant but she has plans to study to become a dental hygienist in the future and she says that she is happy. She is trying to just have the best life possible and she's trying to give her son the best life possible too. I also read on one source that according to a 2013 interview that she did she also
also enjoys exercising and she takes self-defense classes and she also volunteers with the Kershaw County Sheriff's Department to educate parents and their children about stranger danger. What an incredible woman, honestly. In 2018, a Lifetime movie about Elizabeth's story was released. It stars Julia Lalonde as Elizabeth and Henry Thomas as Vincent Fillior and the film is called The Girl in the Bunker. I haven't seen it but I feel like I had heard of it before but I had no idea at the time that it was based on a true story based on Elizabeth's kidnapping but yeah that concludes this video that is the case of Elizabeth show let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this type of video enjoyed hearing a survivor story rather than a murder case because I would love to share more incredible survivor stories with you guys in the future if you do have any suggestions for survivor stories please do let me know in the comments and let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover but yeah thank you so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly bye